Welcome to the first podcast of the series Understanding Readings. This particular podcast was submitted as a university assignment, but I thought to share what I did here as it was a very interesting topic, which I've really enjoyed reading and talking about. I hope to make and post other episodes in the future, so look out for more if you've enjoyed this, and feel free to suggest articles for future episodes. Today, I will comment Inger Skilsbeck's article, Sexual Violence and War, Mapping Out a Complex Relationship. Firstly, I will examine the content uh, of the article and identify its central thesis. Then, I will contextualize its contents and the main examples used. And finally, I will express my general evaluation of the article and delineate its principal limitations. The text analyzed today was written for the International Peace Research Institute and published in the European Journal of International Relations in 2001. The article has an explicit goal to understand the complex relation between sexual violence and war through the analysis of 140 scholarly texts, most of which were written in the 90s. In fact, the wars in the 90s were a turning point from which we can observe the emergence of sexual violence discourse within international law and relations. Due to the feelings of shame and guilt and the taboo nature of the subject, which makes sexual violence an effective weapon, it was common for victims to not come forward or to be kept silent. The author underlines the importance of listening to victims of sexual violence and their experiences to understand the dynamics behind it and the turret. In her analysis, the author identifies three different conceptualizations that had emerged from these texts. The first, epistemological essentialism, has all women as its empirical focus, while the second, structuralism, focuses on targeted women, and finally the third, so- social constructionism, has targeted women and targeted men as its empirical focus. The author immediately declares that the best approach that can help us understand the relation between sexual violence and war is the social constructionist paradigm. The essentialist conceptualization emphasizes the importance of recognizing the atrocity of rape during times of peace, Nonetheless, according to the Geneva Convention, certain acts that are non-permissible during peace are allowed in war times. War zones are places of increased polarization between the genders, where men are called to fight and suppress what are considered to be feminine characteristics, while women must keep the home fires burning. There is a hierarchy in which women are viewed as men's possessions, and during war, possessions can be stolen. Therefore, sexual violence is seen as a way of reinforcing this hierarchy. However, it is debated how these acts reinforce masculinity. This argument has limitation as it excludes that men can be victimized, sees masculinity as static, for instance in the pornography example reported, and not explain why some women are targeted more than others. However, according to the structuralist conceptualization, sexual violence during war affects certain women more than others. Mesnarek states that the inter-ethnic rape, for example, is more prolatical than other kinds of rape. The 1995 Human Rights Watch Global Report on Women's Human Rights declares that rape and conflict under repressive regimes is neither incidental nor private. For instance, the author brings an example that, during the genocide in Rwanda, rape was used for political purposes, as most rapes were directed toward Tutsi women in an attempt to destroy Tutsi culture. This can be applied to the concept of collective victims in Lockhue's chapter, Victims in the book Reconciliation After Violence. Finally, the author endorses the social constructionist conceptualization according to which targeted women and men are victimized. The heteronormative setting tends to associate masculinity 
power and heterosexuality, while vic victimization is thought to coincide with femininity. Therefore, the political, ethnic, and religious identity of the perpetrator is masculinized, while the victim's feminized, therefore seen as less important. In the final section, the author gives a detailed report of the sources used, explaining that the main technique to find information was snowballing. The type of reasoning employed is philosophical, drawing on feminist literature. The article appeals to reason by bringing empirical evidence which can impact future research and policy making. For instance, uh, improving the treatment of victims before the international criminal courts compared to the tribunals in former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Recognizing gender identity and personal experience as biases in the reading, one of the specific one of its biggest limitations, considering that it was written over two decades ago, it had, is its hastiness while discussing heterosis normativity. For example, not including non-binary and transsexual people in the argument, weakening the argument's notion of intersectionality. And finally, it would have been useful to explore changes in time and law of the definition of rape, including, for example, the rape marriage, including, for example, the rape marriage laws. I hope this was informative and I can't wait to know what you think. Thank you for listening.